Good evening. This is Camp Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Shirtliff. The show is heard on WBCQ, the planet, every Monday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it uh, comes out of the beautiful Monticello, Maine, Arista County. And we also started broadcasting on an online internet access, IPM.com. And that would be uh, based out of Concord, New Hampshire, that airs every Saturday at 4 o'clock. The show is sponsored by Camp Constitution, among other things. Camp Constitution runs a week and a day long family summer camp. The next camp we'll have is we'll, we'll run in Orange, New Hampshire from July 10th to the 17th. And you get information about camp and some of the other things we do, the Camp Constitution Press, some of the things we've been publishing. Uh, and we also have some very uh, rare uh, documents in Sam Blumenfeld's uh, archives. If you visit the website, www.campconstitution.net, you can find all that great information. Tonight's guest is Dr. Duke Pesta, who is a professor of English at the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh. He's also the academic director for the Freedom Project Education based at Appleton, Wisconsin. And probably for the last two, two and a half, maybe three years, he's become an expert on the subject of Common Core and has traveled to, oh boy, I don't know, 35, 40 states. Duke, are you there? Hey, Hal, how are you? Thank you. Yeah, uh, we've been in 41 states now. Well, you haven't been in Maine yet, have you, for, for Common Core? We've got to cross off our list. Well, we're going to get you up there soon. This is where the show is broadcast, although it's heard all over the world. We'll definitely get you in Maine, hopefully maybe in the spring or a little sooner. Well, um, I do know we're going to be at a Maine homeschool convention sometime next spring anyway, so maybe we can oh, back well, on that. Yeah. Well, that would be great because that is in late March. That is up in uh, Rockland, Maine, and that's uh, actually right, right around the beginning of spring. So we can plan on having you, uh, if you can spend more than a couple of days, maybe we can have you in the capital area, the southern Maine, even maybe way up in uh, Arista County, but we'll uh, we'll make some plans there. You'll be traveling to uh, Albany, New York. Uh, just, um, I guess, when this show, by when this show actually airs, it would have already come and gone since we record this uh, usually a few days, and in this case, maybe a week in advance. But uh, if people want to know your itinerary, they can. Oh, actually, no, you'll be in Albany um, November 9th, right? Yeah, November, November 9th. 9th a week, uh, yeah. And you'll be speaking at a Christian school there, and then you'll be in Dedham, Massachusetts, on the 10th in the evening at the Endicott Estate on uh, East Street. And I suppose if people want to find out where you'll be, you can visit the Freedom Project Education web- website, which is what, F- F-E-E-U-S-A dot O-R-G. Okay, so they, they're, and, and you you are scheduled to speak in other parts of the country, I guess, over the next several months. Yeah, we're going to be uh, everywhere from Albuquerque to Sacramento and, and then back on the East Coast. Incredible. Anyway... Uh, well, let me give a little background. What got you involved in the Common Core? And then explain what Common Core is and why it must be stopped. Well, I got involved primarily because, well, I've been a lifelong educator, been a 22-year college professor, taught some at the high school level, and uh, got involved with Freedom Project, which is an online homeschool, uh, uh, Freedom Project Academy, is what we're, we've, we've changed. We're changing the name to make it sound a little more scholarly, uh, an online homeschool. Uh, that helps moms and dads uh, educate kids. And right when I was getting involved with Freedom Project, uh, chugging down the train tracks was Common Core. And I I recognized immediately that not only was this going to be very, very bad for public school kids, it was going to ultimately, if it wasn't stopped, give the government a lot of leverage to begin to bully and intimidate and, uh, and set limits on what kind of things moms and dads can do as homeschoolers. And so uh, that, one thing led to another. I gave a talk here and there, and four years later, I've given over 400 of them, and they just keep coming because the uh, Common Core is as bad as we said it was going to be. Well, I remember uh, your, one of your presentations uh, you gave in Worcester, Massachusetts, this past April, April of 2015. Uh, and, and every time you give a presentation, you always add new facts and new figures and uh, information, and it's not just a presentation full of bad news, but some good news, how how certain parents in uh, certain states and towns and counties are are reversing it. So first off, give us a little background. What is Common Core? Who are the people behind it? Who's funding it? 
and how was it uh, introduced and implemented around the country? That's a hugely, uh, Common Core is a hugely complicated subject, but I always like to introduce it in the following way. There are basically two main problems with Common Core, and, and, and each of these two main problems, there's a whole subset of complications and problems and, and disasters that follow in the wake. Number one, Common Core ultimately cedes way too much control of public education, public school education, or what I like to call government education, to the feds. There is no constitutional basis for this. The founding fathers knew that if we created a public school system, then the public school system would, would, would teach to the government, not to the kids. Uh, so there's no, and legally, the feds can't be involved in creating a national curriculum or even national standards. Three different federal statutes dating from 1965 prohibit them from doing so. So Common Core, number one, it cedes way too much control over public education to the federal government. And number two, as we've seen in so many other areas of, of American life, whenever the federal government gets this kind of control over anything, they almost always use that control to import government propaganda and ideology where it doesn't belong. And so now that the feds control uh, from Washington of many aspects of Common Core, most notably the testing and the compliance, uh, what we have here is a system where that is being used uh, in, comp in conjunction with big textbook companies, very crony capitalist textbook manufacturers like Pearson Publishing. This is being used now, Common Core, to indoctrinate kids, to import all sorts of anti-family, anti-American, anti-capitalist ideas into schools. They're rewriting and they're, they're, they're voice divorcing parents from the, from the project of educating their kids. They are training kids now to believe that they are for their first loyalty is to government. Their first, their real mothers and fathers, the ones who, who look after them, is is big government. It's not the family. And so there's rifts being and walls being uh, erected by Common Core between moms and dads who almost don't even who, who who in many instances don't even get to see their kids' homework anymore, and and the schools themselves, which are becoming surrogate parents. And this is, of course, as you know, how this is this predates Common Core. Common Core is not is, is new in as a as an idea. But the gist of it, the trajectory of it, is utterly predictable. We've, we've seen, since, at least since the creation of the Department of Education, an out-of-control bureaucracy in the schools. We've seen the schools and teachers and curriculum producers ceding more and more and more moral and ethical. Now, even, even the school lunch program, which, which went in 40 years from a big federal intervention to feed starving kids an occasional lunch, which now in many places across the country Kids are being fed breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and not just a nine-month schooler in session. Year-round, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you Everything sort of I've done. Where yeah. the is coming from. A common core is a huge step forward in that process. The minute you give them uh, an inch, they uh, try to take a mile or a uh, thousand miles. Now, there, now there is uh, the primary funder of Common Core is uh, this Bill Gates of Microsoft, and he commissioned a couple of people to get the ball rolling. Is that back what, 2007, 2006? This really started, I, it got rolling most uh, vehemently in about 2008. And you are right that as far as private funders go, Bill Gates is the, is the big bankroller. He spent over $7 billion, uh, as we talk today, he spent over $7 billion uh, implementing Common Core, buying it, paying for it, greasing the skids at the state level by providing grant money and technology. Gates has been a major player in this. Not the major player, I would argue, but a major player. And yes, he also funneled a good deal of Gates' money to this small cabal of unqualified individuals who ultimately put these standards together under the umbrella of two Washington lobbyist groups, and that's how it was done. And what were the two groups? The NGA, the National Governors Association, and the CCSSO, the Council of Chiefs State School Officers, now, that's where you get this canard, by the way, that the governors did this, right? Because the NGA was one of the two lobbying groups under whose aegis Common Core was created. Now, the NGA is not a basically 50 state governors locking themselves in a room and banging out education standards. Now, the question becomes, what would, what would qualify a typical state governor? What would qualify him or her to be able to write education standards at the national level, even if it happened that way? I kind of tell my audiences, I really wish it was 50 governors who did this because we have some electoral control over governors. We can always vote them out of the right. like There's an electoral process. But there is some voter accountability there. Uh, this was not done by the governors. The NGA is a lobbying group. There's not a single state governor in office now who had anything to do with the writing of the standards. 
And so that, but, but because it was the lobbyist group who serves the governors, the NGA basically is a, a K Street lobbyist group whose job it is to put donors and politicians in touch with each other to grease the skids for various liberal causes in Washington, D.C. Of course, so there are a number that's of governors the that, groups under which yeah. Common Core was written, but not by any governor. But there are a number of governors that have endorsed it wholeheartedly, including John Kasich and I believe Jeb Bush in Florida. And you could probably name is it Scott Walker. Was he one of the supporters of Common Core? Scott Walker uh, it came to Wisconsin before he became governor. He has never supported it, but he certainly, given that we've given, we have given Governor Scott Walker here in Wisconsin, we've given him the governorship, we've given him the Wisconsin Senate, and we've given him, given him the Wisconsin Assembly, full, full sweep for Republicans. Uh, he refuses to repudiate it. He won't get rid of it, even though he did not technically bring it here. It is true that Jeb Bush is, is arguably the outside of Bill Gates. Jeb Bush is probably the most recognizable of all the big supporters of Common Core. When he was governor of Florida, he worked behind the scenes to get it there. And, of course, Jeb Bush's interest in this stems from his relationship with the Chamber of Commerce at the national level. The National Chamber of Commerce supports Common Core. And uh, he takes a lot of money. Huge campaign contributor to Bush's campaign is the National Chamber. And so Bush has been greasing the skids for that. It's interesting. Now that Bush's poll numbers are really low on the campaign trail, one of the things that's hurt him badly is his support for Common Core. And uh, in the last few months, because he has no choice, he's trying to quietly walk back his support for Common Core or at least pretend as if he's not wedded to it. Uh, and that, of course, that of course is nothing more than campaign desperation. Right, and he's running ads. I've been I've been seeing a few ads on just recently that he's this great conservative. Now, now he's calling himself a conservative, and he's he's going to save us. He's going to create jobs and all this nonsense. Uh, I, was it uh, Mike Huckabee, former governor of was it Oklahoma, Arkansas, Arkansas? Yeah, thank you. He also is uh, supporting Common Core. Well, you know, he's flip-flopped on that tremendously. Initially, he supported it. Then, apparently, somebody, he had no idea what it was. The same thing with Kasich, by the way, in Ohio. Kasich talks about Common Core using the same naive platitudes that people used eight years ago, as if we haven't figured out since then what was really going on. But Huckabee flip-flopped. He he, he supported it. He couldn't figure out why anybody would be against it. Tried to lecture Republicans (laughs) on his radio show to just shut up and take it. Then somebody basically pointed out to him what it was. And then he backed off of it. And so now, actually, uh, he's a non- obviously he's a non-entity on the campaign trail, but uh, he, 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 right. he seems more squarely in the opposed camp, not necessarily because he opposes what the Common Core is, but right. because of the, over, the federal overreach involved in putting it in. But, uh, but ask him again tomorrow. I'm sure he'll change his position then as well. The sad thing is that these folks should ideologically reject it, even no matter, even if it was a great thing, because it's coming out of D.C. It's not constitutional, and that's, that's the problem. Right. I mean, that, and that shows you how how corrupt our government has become. The idea that we have two political parties is absurd. Um, I, I when I talk to my audiences about this, I basically say Common Core really is not a Democrat or a Republican issue. It's not a particularly partisan issue. It is true that those who created, sustained, and supported it first were all liberals, very progressive liberals. But it shows you that in Washington, D.C., as long as more power and more money flows into Washington to support politicians, even, even a, a, a huge swath of our Republicans aren't concerned about the, the unconstitutionality of this, about the overreach, about the indoctrination, about the control, uh, because why? The political class sits in charge of all of it. So we, we don't have a Republican versus a Democrat issue with Common Core. We have a political class versus the rest of us issue. And as we've seen over the last 30 years, those are probably the worst kinds of battles to fight because the political class seems to always get what it wants. Now, who are the two major designers of Common Core? Those actually came up with a curriculum. The, guy, the, the one man most responsible, he's actually called the architect of Common Core, is a man by the name of David Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N. Now, David Coleman, he, he, interesting, he has no educational experience whatsoever. He does not have a degree in education. He has never been a teacher, never taught a class. He has not done any research or publications in the area of education. He has no training. But this is the man that the Common Core Committee tapped to be the moving force for the standards. And it's an interesting side note that I always like to point out with David Coleman. 
No sooner did he help write the standards for which he was not qualified, but he immediately, once he did write the English and math standards, oversee the writing of them, he left the Common Core Committee, and, and miraculous, I don't know how that happened, he ended up the president of the college board, where he is in charge of rewriting tests like the ACTs, the tests that your kids are going to have to take to get into college. So we are allowing the same unqualified man who orchestrated the writing of the standards now suddenly finds himself, without any educational background whatsoever, the president of the college board, where he is transforming not just the exams like the ACT that your kids will have to take to get into college, he's also transforming all the advanced placement tests that your kids, your high school kids are going to take to get college credit. The college board is in charge of that. And what's so shocking is that David Coleman, is, he's never been elected to any office. It is, this is all being done by people who are outside of government. Uh, the, the feds are the ones who put it in. They, they, they were the only ones who could through the federal race to the top program. But all of this is happening. This huge transformation of education, whether it's Bill Gates, who also, as you know, has no educational background, or David Coleman. Uh, the fact is all of this is being done by people we have no uh, – this is public education. We have no electoral. We have no voter uh, privileges with regards to these people. This is uh, the word. The only word I can think of. This is banana republic stuff. When mm. federal government is winking, while some very small, tricksy partisan crony capitalists are completely rewriting the fabric of the country and allowing it to happen. And uh, the other person that was at, what the, the the math the math program was it Zimba. Oh, yeah, well, uh, a little bit uh, farther down the food chain is a fellow by the name of Jason Zimba, Z-I-M-B-A, and Zimba did orchestrate the writing of the math standards. Now, he is at least a mathematician by trade, but not a particularly competent one. A number of mathematicians across the country, including significant mathematician on the, the Common Core Validation Committee, rejected the standards altogether as mathematically inappropriate. But Zimba is, a, is one of the persons responsible a, a partisan political operator responsible for crafting math standards that do not improve the overall quality of math education in this country and uh, really actually uh, put issues of social justice ahead of actual math achievement when it comes to how our kids are going to learn. And one of the interesting things that uh, if anybody goes to uh, YouTube or Vimeo and puts in the search, the search engine common core math problem, They'll find some ridiculous, what, what we would think were absurd and ridiculous examples of how you can take something that's relatively simple or can be explained in a short five-minute segment. Because you know, we homeschool and I teach my children. I'm not, I'm not very good at math, but I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not horrible, and I can follow the instructions. You know, simple things like long division that uh, don't take too much explanation, and most children in their uh, what elementary years can figure it out and solve a very large problem in a matter of a few minutes. This, this, not only do they show this terrible, this convoluted process that most likely gives you the wrong answer, but this group thing too. You get four or five people in the group, and if uh, you come up with a different answer than the group, you've got it wrong. Yeah, and, and that really is the feature of Common Core Math. It's, it's the, 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 the idea that we're going to train kids in, as individuals to be as competent in math as they are personally capable of, those days are gone. The idea that education now is about allowing kids to find out what their academic strengths are and excel at them, those days are gone. Common Core Math is an exercise in collectivism, as you say, and, a, and an experiment in social justice. Basically, it reads like this. Not every kid is good at math. You mentioned you weren't. <laughs> I'll bet you were much better at math than I was. I was lousy <laughs> at it. Uh, and when I was in third grade, I, had, I was doing second grade math. I, I never got much beyond it. It just doesn't appeal to me. It's not something I'm interested in. Um, math, I'm just mathematically challenged. But while I was in third grade, I was also reading at a high school level. And so I was reading everything I could get my hands on. I was except allowed math pro, except to math be textbook, okay right? in math. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I got the grades to pass. But I, but I was also allowed to really get ahead in English. That's gone now. In the name of fairness, what do you think the word common and co common core means? Common means that every kid will only be allowed to get so far, and that is no farther than any other kid. And if you're going to do that, you're going to create a math program that is not designed to allow mathematically gifted kids to search ahead, but instead focuses on those kids who can't do math. And what you're really doing is creating a very low standard, and you're holding back those kids who could theoretically be moving ahead 
because you are concerned that that is socially unfair. It's unjust that some kids could get ahead. And so let's lower the bar and force everybody into the same cookie cutter thing. And, you, I mean, even in this brief conversation we've had, you can see the socialist implications of this, right, that every kid is the same kid. Our approach to education is not to turn out highly qualified individuals in certain areas, but to cookie cutter turn out a one-size-fits-all type of kid, and we call that justice. What's what's fascinating is that um, our system has historically has allowed excellence and let that gifted person let that per- gifted person advance. And you look at the innovations we've had the last hundred years by a handful. All the great inventions and uh, technological advances were made not by millions of people, but you know generally a handful. Thankfully, thanks to our system. And even brilliant people from other parts of the world can come here and excel. But now in the Common Core, we're not looking for excellence. We're not looking for the gifted. And even the people who are better than others, it's, everything's the same. I'm, you know, I'm thinking if, if I was a gifted maths or gifted English, and I'm in, uh, getting, learning Dick and Jane and C-Spot wrong, what I should be reading Shakespeare like you were, I'm going to have some problems. And the best way to solve those problems is to what? Give that child some psychotropic drug. Well, there's you know, that. Just, they, at, the, at the beginning stages, sure, sure. Uh, kids who uh, rebel, kids who, hey, you know who is who's suffering? A bad math student like me isn't any more frustrated by Common Core math. That's the thing. Common Core math is obtuse. It's needlessly complicated. It relies far too heavily on gimmickry and meaningless group assignments. So as a bad math student like I was, this wouldn't make me any more math illiterate. I was going to be math illiterate no matter what. Right. You know who suffers? The kind of trauma you're talking about, the kids who are rebelling intellectually and mentally, are the ones who can do math because they're not allowed to do it. Right. The kids for whom math is an obvious thing and now have to go through all these ridiculous steps, have to uh, waste their time in groups with other kids who have no idea what they're talking about. The whole thing is slowed down. So the kids who can really do math here are the ones who are, like you said, rebelling. And, and so... It's, it's, an, it's an opportunity, yes, to drug kids more, to classify kids more, which the federal government loves to do. But on the way out, too, uh, when we're done, uh, people ask me all the time, well, why in the world would our federal government want an educational system that's going to guarantee lower levels of achievement across the board? Well, and the answer is kids who can't look after themselves, can't create their own wealth, aren't smart enough to become entrepreneurs, can't create and take care of their families, those kids are going to be the kinds of kids who will be very eager to turn their liberties over back to the federal government in terms of in place of security. So we're creating a situation of dumbed down generations because those generations need government much more than free and educated generations do. And this is how you usher in the new world order. This is how you usher in a society of uh, generations of young people. Uh, why is Bernie Sanders so absolutely popular among college age kids? because they don't know anything about economics and they don't know anything about socialism. All they know is he's promising them free college tuition. So there's your free guy stuff. right there. This free is what stuff, you get right. with a dumbed-down <laughs> electorate. One of the more troubling aspects of Common Core is this data mining. Can you explain what happens and how this is, what's this got to do with math and English and science and history? Well, that's a complicated uh, situation as well. The fact is, is that in every other walk of life, I think Americans recognize this. We see out-of-control federal agencies. We've got Google and Facebook spying on its own customers for the government. We've got all sorts of data gathering. Every time you click on a website, spyware is tracking where you go. When we recognize the obvious that this is everywhere, we shouldn't be surprised, however dismayed we are, we shouldn't be surprised that it's all over our schools too. All this so-called technology now that our kids have to have. People like Bill Gates, right, or Mark Zuckerberg providing, providing uh, iPads and laptop computers for all these school kids. And moms and dads thinking, oh, this is wonderful. These guys are just right. committed. Well, in reality, all this so-called free stuff your kids are getting, it has all sorts of data gathering capacity where your kids go, what they do, how they use that technology. And so the testing itself, the mechanism to test your kids is all computer-based now. Many of the lesson plans, much of the, many of the textbooks can only be accessed in the classroom on those computers during school time. And so all of that involves data gathering, record keeping. Uh, all of this is happening at a phenomenal pace, much more so 
even for kids than for adults. The, the government is really interested in tracking, using data and technology to transform how kids interact. And uh, while we're on this little segue, that's why Bill Gates is doing this. People say to me all the time, well, Bill Gates, Bill Gates has no educational qualifications. Why is he doing this? Well, he's a technocrat. I don't think he does care about education. I think he cares about technology and the power of technology to completely transform whole-scale, huge populations. I mean, you think about the 2008 election as a model. One of the reasons Obama won is because you had all of these data people who weren't trying to make a case for their candidate. They were trying to manipulate people based on how they use technology, and it was highly successful. And so you see that happening here, too. It's control. What the government is after here is much greater control of the population, much more dependency from the population, who's going to need them, who's going to be glad to give up guns if it means more food stamps, going to be glad to give up individual school boards and individual school districts monitoring students if it means more federal money pouring into Department of Education and lower, and lower uh, real estate property taxes to boot. This is the calculated gamble the feds are making, that Americans couldn't be conquered, but they sure as hell could be bought if you spent the right amount of their own taxpayer money, gave, gave the right amount of their own taxpayers' money back to them. It's amazing how they bribe you with, their, with our own money. Exactly. In the few minutes we have left, what should listeners do who are concerned about this? Well, how can they get a hold of you? What do you recommend they do? Uh, and, uh, the first give us, some, do give us some, positive, some positive stuff, some good things that are happening uh, around the country. Sure. First thing you've got to do is educate yourself. There are a thousand ways to do it. We're, eight year, we're six, seven and a half years into the Common Core era. The failure, the evidence of failure is everywhere. So educate yourself. At the worst case scenario, go to fpeusa.org. We've got all sorts of videos and articles and information. All of it's free. We don't ask you for a dime. Just go and take the information and educate yourself, first of all, number one. Number two, get your kids out of the public school. Common Core is not going anywhere this year or next year or the year after that. So even if, you know, you, you're, you wake up and recognize this is bad, it's other than pulling your kid out of public schools and either homeschooling them or finding a, a, a reliably anti-common core private school, your kids are going to, they're going to suffer because of this. And as parents, our first responsibility is to look after those kids. Now, what can we do? And is there hope? In the short term, I don't think there is. Common core was dug so deep, paid for, was laid, the foundations laid so thick before anybody even had any idea what it was, that it is not going to go away over. It, it took us 11 years to get rid of No Child Left Behind, and that was a disaster. And it yeah. didn't have uh, a six-year head start like Common Core did. So what you can do, though, is play a long game. Play the long game. Here's where the hope is. If, as long as we get moms and dads to recognize that they, they are primarily in charge of their kids' education, not the federal government. If we get more parents to recognize that, then those parents will take action. That means if they keep their kids in public school, they find a way to tutor them outside of the school to get them up to speed where they need to be. If their kids are learning anti-Americanism in their high school history classes, an engaged parent will make damn sure that he or she teaches them real history on their own time. And there can be a lot more parents then who put their kids in so private so schools with guaranteeing them a classical education. And there are going to be even more parents who recognize that the only way to do this is homeschooling. Good news? It was in the last 10, year, 10 years, American homeschoolers went from 2 million to 3 million families in just wow. 10 years. That's a huge jump. So people are waking up to the problem, and the problem is when the feds control anything, they do it poorly, and then they use that control to, to take away our privileges and rights. If we see it in other walks of life, we have to recognize it to an education. Well, Doug, I want to thank you for coming on our show. I'm looking forward to uh, being with you in uh, November. God bless you, and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Hal. I look forward to seeing you soon.